What's up, Degenerate Nation? Welcome to the Big Bets on Campus podcast presented by BetMGM. This is the National Championship College Basketball Betting Preview. I'm Stucky, and joining me for today's episode are Mike Calabrese and Anthony DeBundo. We will recap the Final Four tournament in general, and then just talk briefly about the game and maybe some props that we're targeting. We'll also have a live show tomorrow afternoon, so make sure you check that out as well. I will say we have a potential for a really good final, which I hope we get because, in my opinion, this has been ultimately a pretty boring tournament. Uh, it's, you know, we got all the chalk early, not a lot of upsets, not a lot of buzzer beaters either, like not a lot of thrilling games set up for, hey, we're going to get a great Sweet 16 Elite Eight Final Four. Didn't really work out that way. Uh, I think the Jamal Shedd injury, which I talked about a lot, really hurt. Like Purdue Houston would have been awesome. Um, I think instead we had like, you know, DJ Burns like jogging down the court for half the game, um, trying to keep up with Purdue. And then the juggernaut that is UConn. Uh, this team just continues to find ways to cover numbers. Uh, no matter the circumstance, they just have so many different ways that they can beat you. But here we are with the number one and number two overall teams in Ken Palm. This will only mark the 10th time we've seen two number one seeds face off in the national title most of them have been close with the exception of the last one we saw between gonzaga and baylor or when baylor won that game by 16 uconn looking to become the first back-to-back national title winners since florida did it and the first ever to do it by going 12 and 0 against the spread all 12 wins i believe would be by 13 or more points which is pretty crazy but let's before we get to the national title game um we we let's like just get your quick thoughts on what you saw in the final four um i mean look obviously we know UConn's dominance I, the the craziest thing to me 27 and 6 against the spread since 2009 i i, I mean just stunning whenever UConn gets in the tournament it's pretty crazy but Anthony, I'll go to you. What was your takeaway from the Final Four? And by the way, I'll have you guys both think about, before we get to the game, I'll ask you your favorite moment of the tournament uh, in a bit, but something you can ponder over. But Anthony, what were your thoughts on the Final Four? Yeah, you know, I think the kind of gets into the tournament as a whole when you think about it. I was at a charity event last night with like 100 people. I made sure we had a screen and I was kind of like the guy at the event who like kept going to watch the game over by the bar and people kept coming up to me not to talk about men's but to talk about the women's game, which I thought was really interesting in that it was probably like outnumbered 5 to 1 in interest in the women's game versus the men's this year and and look, you know, credit to Caitlin Clark in South Carolina. Congrats to them. Incredible. I think it kind of speaks to how weird this tournament has felt in a lot of ways, uh, because yes, there weren't a lot of incredibly compelling games. We got the final four where we had these three bigs with Burns, Edie, and Klingon, and it it does feel like we need a big final to save the tournament, because I agree. Uh, When you think about like the most memorable moment, I had one that immediately came to mind. I don't really need to think about it because it happened at the same time, and it was Auburn and Yale at the final minute, at the same time as KJ Simpson's buzzer beater for Colorado. Colorado, Colorado yeah. Florida. That's mine. Yeah, that was an incredible game. They were simultaneous. They were in the same couple minutes, those two games yeah. ending. Was probably the the highlight of the entire tournament for me because from the Sweet 16 on, you know, Purdue Tennessee was a good game. But other than that, I I there's not one moment, you know, like DJ Burns going crazy on Duke was awesome from like a like a as a Duke hater perspective. But other than that, like what was the enjoyment out of uh, out of yeah, the it wasn't, it wasn't like it was close in the final minute or two. Right. They were um, up 12. It was just cool to see, you know, Burns cook like that. But uh, yeah, I mean, the fact that the biggest story of the tournament is more likely to play in the NFL than the NBA is, is probably not great for the, the, the memorability of this tournament. But again, a great final could save everything. Yeah. I, it just didn't, it felt like one of the least hyped final fours, men's final fours in a while. Uh, even myself, I wasn't even that excited excited like i figured uconn was gonna win i thought purdue was gonna blow out uh nc state i mean we had two of the biggest spreads ever which is re- very disappointing in a game in a tournament where we didn't have a lot of upsets early then we have in the seeding era the highest combined spreads in the final four but now we get and i guess it's kind of fitting i talked about all 
uh, leading up to the tournament, how we, we don't have, there hasn't been many ones and twos play each other. Now we're, we got a couple one versus twos and we have two ones that are left standing before we get to the game. Calabrese, what were your takeaways of uh, the final four? Well, I agree with both of your sentiments that we need a classic title game to save this situation in terms of the whole tournament. But at least according to Ken Palm, this is the second highest, you know, um, sum between the two teams in terms of their uh, adjusted efficiency coming into the title game in the last 22 years. The only one that was higher was Baylor against Gonzaga. Um, so I think certainly there's the potential for this to be a heavyweight bout and go back and forth. And let's keep in mind, yes, UConn has won and covered in every single game in the last two tournaments. They became the first team to do that in 10 in a row, according to our Evan Abrams, in the seeding era. So 1979 onward. Now they're up to 11 straight in terms of winning and covering. But Purdue has also been an incredible team against the spread this entire year. They're 8-1-1 one one against the spread when facing ranked opponents, which makes them the, the highest win percentage against the spread by any team in the last 15 years when facing at least 10 ranked opponents throughout the course of the season. So I think the high end for both of these teams, we all know UConn deserves their flowers in every way, shape, and form, going on a 30-0 run for the first time, for, for a team to go on a run for 30-0 for the first time in the last three and a half seasons. It's been incredible what the Huskies have done, but I think Purdue is kind of in this wonderful position where the public is kind of viewing this as a coronation for UConn. And they can actually play an underdog card, yet they have the two-time defending AP National Player of the Year. So it's it's incredible what they've been able to accomplish. I'm really hoping that they play their best game because here's my thoughts on the Final Four. I had a double result. I had Alabama to win the first half and UConn to win the game. Alabama couldn't have played any better on offense. It was unbelievable. They shot eight for 11 from three. I'm like, perfect. They, did, they were drawing dead in the last minute. Like that is the kind of juggernaut and the kind of performance that the Huskies have put together. I will say this though, and this kind of goes into my pick for the game. I just want to tee it up in this way. UConn is incredibly dominant, but everything that's happened, particularly last year, shouldn't really have any bearing other than a historical argument. You know, are they as good as 06, 07 Florida? Those are all fun conversations, but that doesn't matter. Just looking at the last six weeks, they've won 12 games. They beat Marquette twice without Kolick. And really their best win is against an Illinois team that if we, you know, hit the rewind button and we go to this very same podcast and we listen to us just dumping on how bad Illinois' defense was and how soft they were at the rim. And then Bama, we said much worse things about their defense throughout the course of the year. I think there's a chance we're overvaluing a little bit what UConn's done because they've done it so convincingly. It's not just that they win, they're beating the brains out of everybody. That's great. But have they really faced a team at this caliber in the last six weeks? The answer is no. Um, I mean, I could go back here and look like an idiot by the time we talk about this game next, but I think there's a good chance that Purdue keeps it close. So I'll, I'll save that for the rest of the conversation, but those are just my thoughts on the Final Four and the NC State. It was just a snoozer. I'm glad yeah. I mean, somebody you had that about Pur- You could say the same thing about Purdue, though. Pur- who'd Purdue play? It, Tennessee. You could say Tennessee. Yo, Tennessee. but Calabrese hates Tennessee and says that they're trash and Barnes is trash, so... You got to pick one. Is Tennessee legit? Or, 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 or... I mean, that, that's why I'm saying I have the sample size of 10 ranked games throughout the course of the year against ranked opponents. Going 8-1-1 one, and one against the spread is really impressive. Do I think that the wrong team is favored here? Absolutely not. I think the number is just about right. I think UConn deserves it. I think they should be in a position. They should win this game 7 out of 10 times. But I think the public narrative is like, oh, this is a fait accompli. Of course, the Huskies are going to run away with this. I'm not in that camp. My favorite yeah, narrative can... in all of college yeah. sports is the, like, who have they actually beat? And then you start picking apart the schedule. You're like, well, you know, this team, they beat them, but their defense wasn't that good. And then they beat them because I actually did this uh, before the final four, because I felt the same thing about last year. When we talked about UConn, the run they ended up having versus the run they could have had, they could have played Kansas, mm-hmm. but they got Arkansas. They got a Miami team that ran better than that, better than God to get to the final four. They got a very limited offensive team in San Diego state in the final. So it felt like, yes, they dominated everybody in that run. Good for them, but it opened up a lot. Like they didn't have to play a lot of these top five, six teams that we thought coming into the tournament. This year is kind of broken similarly where, you know, Auburn gets jumped early. Uh, they get Illinois, but again, these games haven't really been close. It's not like they're like squeaking right. by these teams. Right. So the, here's the thing for me, UConn last year, I know it's a different team, but UConn started undefeated. They they went into conference play last year undefeated. Uh, and they took some early Big East losses. They struggled through the Big East. 
But then when it came to stepping out of the Big East again, complete juggernaut again. And this year, they have one loss in the non-con at Kansas uh, when Kansas was closer to full strength. Castle didn't true, play. Again. Right. Mm-hmm. True road game. So they've had one loss out of conference in two years now. Uh, and that, for me, you, you can't spin a schedule argument on that anymore. Like, it's just, it is what it is now. Yeah, I... Yeah, and I would argue that Purdue probably benefited the most out of any team in this tournament by not at by not having to face Houston in the Final Four. We we said all year there's three clear powerhouses: it's Houston, Purdue, and UConn. And you know, it's because Shed gets hurt, Purdue gets to face NC, a team that finished under 500 in the ACC in the Final. And, four. and it wasn't just Shed either; like it, they got decimated by injuries. Like uh, Houston yeah. at full strength, I think it absolutely beat UConn at full strength. And I think they would have beaten Purdue, but it was just unfortunate, you know, throughout the course of the year, nobody's deep enough to be able to handle those kind of injuries. And the shed one was, you know, the, the final straw. But in general, I, I agree with the sentiment that Purdue was also fortunate. That being said, they still beat the Zags convincingly. They beat Tennessee. Like, I mean, they it, got it's job. not a total cakewalk to the title game. Yeah, they got a both, good two. Yeah. Tennessee yeah, was a one seed until the last week of the regular season. Yeah, they're both undefeated against the spread in the tournament. Uh, both deserve to be here. The spread is let's see where it's sitting at now. It's high. It's now. I mean, at some. I think I, I saw a seven about ten minutes ago. Yeah, you can get the ju- little seven minus one fifteen out there uh, on Purdue sitting. I will say consensus Connecticut six and a half point favorite total one forty six. That's coming down to 145 and a half, open much higher, which I thought it was a bit too high. Um, I make this like four and a half. Um, and you, so there's definitely a tax on UConn right now. Like, and I don't like because they do have, they remind me sort of of 2019 LSU, who just would cover no matter what. And eventually, when they got when it, they got to the national title, because my numbers could never catch up to them, so I faded them a bunch and lost. They got to the national title. I just threw my hands up and said, "I'm I'm back in this team." Um, yeah, <laughs> how, I, how were you feeling when they were down ten nothing in the title game? You're like, "Of course, this is the moment." And then they just yeah. went god mode. <laughs> I was like, "Yeah, of course, I'd jump on now." And they ended up covering. So my I can't do that here, um, but I would think about you know when when I look at this game, I would think about potentially getting in on Purdue first half and especially if we get like a four um, because we've seen UConn have some slow starts and what I think, you know, the, obviously the battle, of the bigs in this game is going to be massive. You have Klingon, you have Edie going up against each other. And I think that there's a really good chance, a much better, I shouldn't say really good, but a much better chance that Klingon gets in foul trouble early than Edie. And Purdue going up against UConn knows that they can't really afford to sit Edie for a long stretch. Whereas we've seen Hurley multiple times, like if Klingon gets in foul trouble in the first half, like he'll sit extended minutes and they have better front court depth. So, you know, I can see... Klingon going one on one with defensively against Edie, picking up one, you know, one foul in the first couple minutes, another with like thirteen to go, and he sits for like seven to eight minutes, um, and you know that could open up the door for Edie to have some easy paths to offense. I do think eventually Connecticut's guards, like just the perimeter advantage that they have, like what do you do with Lawyer in this game? Like defensively, what do you what do you do with lawyer? I don't know. Um, I think that the 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 versatility and the athletic advantage that Connecticut will have on the outside will just be too much, and then the bigs will kind of neutralize each other. Is how I see it playing out. Um, but I think because of that foul trouble and like just that the I could see Klingon sitting for extended minutes in the first half, but can't really see that with Edie. And we've seen UConn just be slow. And then eventually they just, they just hit you with these runs in the second half and inevitably cover these games. So I might look at Purdue first half, the two props that I like 
I'm going to go Klingon under points. He's sitting at like 14 and a half. It's scary, but if you look at like similar defenses that they've played, I expect this game to be slower pace, more in the half court. Like when they played Kochbrenner with two, you know, he played them twice. I think he had like six and 12 points. He played, you know, Kansas. Gonzaga, he did go off against Ike. And, but that was about it. There was, I think, five games where he played like, Similar structured defense with a dominant defensive big. And he didn't clear this number in four of the five games. In those four games, he only averaged about eight points per game. Foul trouble. It's kind of my same case that I had for Burns. Now, Klingon will have has more length, but he's just not going to enjoy the same like length advantage and physicality advantage on the low block uh, that he normally does now that he's going up against Edie. So I like him under, and then I might go with Braden Smith over 10 and a half points. I think he's cleared this number in 58, 60% of his games this year. But how do you beat UConn? You got to do it in the mid-range. He's their most efficient mid-range shooter. Castle being on him does worry me a bit, but he's coming off a really bad game. I expect him to bounce back. He's probably going to play 40 minutes here. So you're going to have him on the court the entire game. Um, so I, I think I like Smith over points, Klingon under points, and I'm going to be looking maybe for, for, for two Purdue first half. Uh, I'm, I'm admittedly, I show value in Purdue. I just have, I've been saying it. I show a little bit of value in Alabama at 12. I just don't want to get in front of this UConn train. I tried it once with San Diego state. We all saw that that worked out. Anthony curious to get your thoughts here on this game. Well, there was some sharp buyback late. Saturday and yeah, it, close ended up, it closed at 10 10 and I was sitting there looking at it like man I should just lay this uh and I laid the second half on our live show Saturday and I'm doing it again minus two and a half minus 20 uh I love UConn in the second half here I agree with your point stuck about the first halves we have seen a lot less clinging in the first half I thought than I was expecting against Alabama there was multiple stretches where I was like oh Klingon's not in again Klingon's not in again like OK, and like you said, they have the depth to withstand it. Uh, they're going to change how they guard ball screens, which would be interesting. Like it, it is interesting when Klingon's not on the floor. I think they're more vulnerable, obviously, at the rim, but also uh, offensively with just how dominant he is on the offensive glass, too. But I think the versatility of UConn's offense is the, the key that unlocks everything that they do, because when they have all the ball screen stuff they run and it doesn't start working, they have two options. They can either go pick and roll or they can just push transition more. And they're extremely elite at both. And the the pick and roll rim running was what broke Alabama for me last uh, Saturday night because it was dunk, dunk, dunk. All of a sudden it was a tie game and all of a sudden it was eight. That quick 8-0 run I thought really broke Alabama and their ability to do that on anybody at any time because of their switching defenses you never know what to expect and you're right about lawyer he probably i mean th it was interesting that oats went and tried to sag off and not really guard castle and he hit the early threes i don't really think you can do that with lawyer but also i think yukon's just going to put him in hell and make him run around and guard ball screens and eventually get a mismatch and take advantage like it's hard to hide him whereas i think smith we saw the NC State guards give ball pressure problems to him. Like they were up in his grill. He had a horrible first half. He ended the game with uh, five turnovers. He had three against Tennessee. So we've seen his turnover numbers even take a little bit of a spike as he's faced these, you know, more elite backcourt defenses. And Castle, top 15 pick in the draft probably, mainly because of his, his, his athleticism and his defensive ability, the way that they think he can guard at the next level. And Evan, Evan Mia has a, a Bayesian performance rating metric. He's top 20 defensively in the country there. And it's interesting, Klingon and Edie, number one and number two in that metric. So ultimately, I think second half UConn is the way to look at this game. I think they have the ability to pull away. And I think Castle's length and athleticism will wear down Smith. And Smith, as much as <clears throat> posting up Edie is the engine of the Purdue offense, Smith is, they have nobody else who can execute that role in any way like he can. And so if he's not effective, you saw how bad their offense was in the first half. A lot of that had to do with 
him just not really being effective. So I, I, I see the point about his over points at 10 and a half. Like it seems low because he has been kind of bad three of the last four games, but also he's got an NBA elite NBA pros- prospect defending him, which has not happened much in the big 10 this year. And when we saw NC States, you know, really quick guards on him, he struggled. So I have a little more hesitancy about Smith, but I like UConn second half call me square, but I'm happy to lay it. Yeah. I mean, I honestly think square, uh, that has been the key the to way to go tournament. in this tournament. Uh, yeah. I like it more than laying six and a half for sure. I think think this game is going to be close for a bit, and then UConn makes their run. Yeah, the for what it's worth, this tournament favorites most profitable since two thousand eight. Favorites of eight plus twenty and five against the spread, best ever by far. Top three seeds twenty one and ten against the spread uh, versus teams that were seeded four or more best since two thousand nine, uh, and then I believe public sides like based on just percentage of bets were hit at 73 percent in the tournament um depending on where you looked but yeah i mean i i get your point that what does scare me with with smith going up against castle but you know and he's going to get some switches so he's not going to be on the whole game and i i don't think he's going to be you know uber efficient but think about Purdue's what he averages and you know, and obviously he's not going up against as elite of defenses. And as as you pointed out, a guy like Castle every night. But most nights, Purdue is one of the most post-heavy offenses in the country. Last two years, the most. So most nights, everything they do is predicated on getting it inside to Edie, right? And how many times does he have his hook shots, his easy looks? When Klingon's in there, that's not going to be the case, right? So he's not going to have as many easy looks, and he's not going to... I don't think the volume is going to be there for Edie. So, you know, then I'm like, all right, what, what can lawyer deal with the physicality? So I just think the volume for Smith has to go up. And, you know, UConn allows you to get mid-range shots. He's their most efficient mid-range shooter. I mean, I think that they're going to have to go more pick and roll, less just like post-reliant offense. And Smith's going to have to hit shots. So I don't think he's going to be overly efficient, but I think that his volume will have to pick up um, based on the matchup. But uh, I definitely worry about him on Castle. And yeah, his turnovers were definitely, he was, he was struggling a bit, even with McConnelly, a back-to-back backcourt violations. Uh, but I'll, uh, Calbreeze, I'll throw it to you. What are you seeing here? So I'm glad that you brought up Klingon's under on points because the one that I'm targeting is under 21 and a half points plus rebounds. You mentioned the comps when facing similar bigs. So he faced Indiana's where Dickinson from KU, Baycott and Kalkbrenner twice. In those five instances, he averaged 8.2 points and 5.6 rebounds. So far beneath this. And I think we're selling right now at the absolute peak of his value. Like now they're talking about him being a top three NBA draft pick. Like, I think we need to pump the brakes a little bit. Like the fact that he dominated some of the defenses that they played in the last few games, I would hope that he would dominate them. I think it's it's a very different animal in terms of playing against Edie, who, you know, he's a historically good foul drawer. It, according to Ken Palm, he draws over 10 fouls per game, which is tops in the country. We know this. What's interesting to me is if Klingon goes out, do they switch to kind of that trapping style you saw NC State, what did Edie have, five turnovers? There was multiple times when he was quickly overwhelmed. I wonder if Hurley and his staff looks at that video and says, we don't just have to go 1v1 with Klingon against him every single time. We can maybe get some extra turnovers and possessions if we're able to vary our defense a little bit. So that's just something to keep an eye you on. You got to dig down on him. He Sometimes he drops the ball down instead of going right up and like strips. That's like some of the most effective defense that I've seen uh, against Edie is of the help variety. Um, so I do think Klingon will get a, a lot of one-on-one assignments because of his length. Um, and UConn will say like, we're not going to let, you know, we don't want open threes, but they're also going to help at times. Um, this is, uh, they're going to help. And I think that there could be some turnovers, uh, as far as that's concerned. Um, but go ahead. I'm sorry. Additionally, in terms of the under on points and rebounds, Purdue, as we know, they're elite on the glass. You know, they're third in offensive rebounding rate in the country. They collect 27 defensive boards per game, which is ninth. And when you look at teams that were similar in the Big East that were really good on the offensive glass, like St. John's, Klingon had 10 rebounds in the two games combined. So I, I think that's that's a positive in terms of this, you know, trending under. 
for the game itself, I look at, you know, can Purdue do what they need to do in a, you know, a big venue? A lot of, a lot is made of teams not being able to shoot the basketball. They were right on their season average against NC State. They knocked down 40% of their threes. They're going to need a similar night to hang in it. And even though I can make this argument for Purdue, who, by the way, comes into this game, the last 27 national champions, they have a higher Ken Palm adjusted efficiency rating than 13 of them. So in a regular year, when you take out a juggernaut like this year's UConn, this would be all about where does UConn or where's Purdue place if they were to win this game historically, like that would be the conversation. So I don't think that many things have to go right for them to hang around. I'm not necessarily interested in them winning the game outright. What I am interested in is UConn's margin of victory, one to five points. It's about seven to two in the market. And when I look at this particular matchup, I noticed some things against Alabama that caught my eye, and I wonder if the Purdue staff is trying to think in, in a similar way. Tanner McGrath at Action Network, he's done a phenomenal job breaking down all the sets that UConn runs. Like When they are running their offense the way that it's intended to be run, it's like a Swiss watch. All the screens, the, all the action, the, the fact of the matter is they move the ball and they get people in space all over the court. It's beautiful. But Bama, essentially, and I know it didn't work out. They're leaving Castle wide open. He knocks down th some threes, gets confidence, and then plays a great game. But there was a stretch of that game when they started knocking down some threes where they fell in love with the three, and they weren't running their offense. And the announcing team and the color team, they were, like, really harping on it. And then, obviously, in the second half, they got more into their sets, and they were ruthlessly efficient, as they've always been. I wonder if there's a chance for the Purdue staff to do the same, which is, like, you know, strategically – leave some guys open to take some threes to get them out of their sets a little bit. That's just something early on that I want to keep an eye on because if it's just a pure half court battle, who can execute better on offense, who can execute better on defense in the half court? The answer to both questions, in my opinion, is UConn. Um, but I really like this, this margin in terms of it being a tight game, one to five plus three forty. you know, you can probably get it a little bit better if you shop around. That's where I'm going to end up putting my money um, because I, I think there's, a good chance in terms of pressure as well. As I mentioned, Purdue, no one's expecting them to win this game. And if Braden Smith can come out of his mini funk, all of a sudden, I think these teams are a lot closer. I, I would say if I knew for a fact that he was going to play his season average, if he was going to score 14 points and not turn the ball over all that much and facilitate, I would say this is probably a one possession game in favor of UConn. If he plays and shoots one for 10 again and has turned the ball over, I think this could be another runaway. But I'm going to bank on you know him having a bounce back. And the fact is, I think this Purdue team over the course of the season has proven that they haven't been overwhelmed by any nationally ranked opponents. I know that UConn's in another stratosphere, but I'm not sure they're going to be intimidated. And that, that underdog card's a nice one to be able to play in a spot like this. So that's my play. I'm going to have some live takes and some live bets based on what I'm seeing from UConn's offense. But I, I want to kick it back to you guys. What do you think about UConn having fallen in love with the three a little bit? It's great when it's going down, but there was a stretch where, you know, Alabama took that first half lead. I think they were up by five. And that's when Hurley called a timeout and was like, all right, let's get back to what we do. And then they just, you know, basically put them through the meat grinder. Yeah, I mean, it's a team that they just they, I, like. I feel like ever we're just like grasping for straws to find any potential weaknesses. Um, <laughs> I think that's I think like, that's a fair point. They fell in love with the three for six minutes. We got to fade them here. Um, like at, they, uh, yeah. I mean, look, the one thing that I will say is that against Purdue, it's Purdue's a dominant rebounding team, so mm -hmm. Connecticut can't afford those stretches because you know, like off. And they're not hitting shots or, um, you know, a couple of the games this tournament, they went, what, three of 17, three of 19 from three. But they get so many rebounds that it doesn't even matter. But that's not necessarily going to be the case against Purdue. Purdue is an elite rebounding team on both ends, uh, in large part due to ED. So, yeah, if they have a really off shooting night and, fall, and do fall in love with the three a bit too much, Purdue is going to be uh, right there. Um, but you know, if UConn has a great shooting night, I don't, uh, then it's lights out. If they're around just season average, then I think it's going to come down to, you know, can Purdue, the Purdue guards match the physicality, the playmaking, uh, of UConn's, uh, on the perimeter. And then the whistle is going to be, uh, it's, it's probably going to play at least a minor role, like, 
does Klingon get in foul trouble? Could Edie could too. Edie's very good about not fouling, but it doesn't mean he's incapable of getting into foul trouble. Uh, so, but I will say to your point, if they do fall in love with the three and they're just not hitting again, uh, cause it's not like an elite, elite three point shooting team. It's an elite offense, like the stuff that they run, but it's not like the best three point shooting team we've ever seen. So if they have like a three of 20 night, like they're not, they're not going to be getting all of the offensive rebounds as we've seen them do in many of these games where it doesn't even matter what they're shooting. They're just going to blow you out anyway. But uh, as far as pace is concerned, Anthony, I think that you had such a uh, a bad take on the NC State Purdue total that I have to give your thoughts uh, here. Um, your due. Um, but any thoughts on on how you see this game undertook media pretty sharp money, and the total came down. I'm cl- I'm closer to where it is right now, which I would have gotten some like one. I think it opened at one forty nine. Yeah. Um, but I, I expect this game to be played more in the half court. I mean, UConn is they're 328th in adjusted tempo, but they're they're kind of a pace taker at times. Um, whereas like you want to run, they'll be like, all right, we'll run and beat you that way. Like a couple of the St. John's games that get, you know, that are super fast. But I would think it's weird. Purdue Matt Painter in every timeout says we need to push the ball and run like every media timeout this whole tournament. But um, I expect Purdue to slow this game down and this to be played in the half court without many transition opportunities. Is Would you agree with that? So, I mean, Bama got like nothing in transition. Nothing. Like nada. And uh, I think UConn wants to play this a little faster. Now I'm not betting the over. I'm, I'm retiring from totals uh, the rest of the season. After that, over 146, I ended up closing 147 and landed what 113. Uh, so j- just missed it. But I'll buy you a beer with that point of CLV next time I see. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, the so the reality is for me, we to go back to the the thing about the turnovers because you talked about rebounding edge. UConn isn't going to dominate rebounds. Purdue got outshot in terms of shot volume by NC State. NC State shot really poorly from three, but Purdue's turnovers gave NC State a lot of extra possessions to stay in that game. I think as much as UConn's rebounding edge is maybe nullified by Purdue's dominance of the glass, UConn's ability to force Purdue into mistakes with their ball pressure could be an even bigger issue for Purdue in terms of maximizing possessions. Like if you if you offered me a bet, if you include free throws and whatnot, who will attempt more shots in this game? I'm going to take UConn like trips to the line plus field goal attempts. I'm taking UConn just because of the turnover differential. So Purdue has to make up for that. I think with their three pointers, but as far as the total goes, I am concerned about UConn wanting to play faster Purdue being forced to give away possessions via turnovers. I think that's the biggest red flag for me. I know that UConn, if you just pull up their Ken Palm page, hasn't forced a ton of turnovers this year relative to like, you know, some of the more pressure defenses we see across the country, but they're not incapable of doing it. It's something they can do and probably will do in this matchup. So I would actually, if I, if you, if you made me bet it, I would bet the under, but uh, I, I, like I said, I'm retiring from totals after that brutal call Saturday, but I think that UConn will get some opportunities in transition just because they don't want Edie to just man the paint. They want to try to take advantage. And if they can beat Purdue on the floor, they probably think they have an edge in transition offense. But I don't think Purdue is going to want to get into a into a faster paced game, and Purdue is just as good at controlling tempo. And so, usually in that in that case, when you have a disciplined team that wants to play slow, they're going to get their style imprinted on the game. And so, I just think this game is going to be pretty slow. Yep. Uh, any other props you gentlemen wanted to add or to get everything out of your system for this? We do have our our live show, as I mentioned earlier. So make sure you check that out. Uh, we will have uh, more time to break this game down, so we might have. Some additional props. We'll also have uh, either Nick or Sean joining us in addition to, I believe, Charlie. But uh, any other props? It, the two props that stuck out for me I already mentioned were the Smith over points and uh, Klingon under points. Anything else you guys had? I was looking at Kaufman Wren under five and a half at Ben MGM plus 115. I think that. You know, him and Gillis kind of split time at the four, and then Kaufman Wren has come in and played the five when Edie's out. I mean, I don't think Edie's coming out of this game for more than a couple minutes uh, yeah. because it is such a you know vital game. So you're you're taking out his minutes at the five, and then it's kind of like, do we want more offense or defense? 
in this matchup, I think Purdue is going to have to be scoring to keep up with UConn's juggernaut, and they're going to want Gillis to space the floor more and maybe even take Caravan and, and try to beat him, where I think it's probably the, the weaker spot of the UConn defense is Caravan when he's on the floor at the same spot. So I think they're going to prioritize Gillis, and we've even seen that the last two games uh, where Gillis became, you know, took more minutes, more points, more scoring over Kaufman Wren, who has played less than 16, 17 minutes in just about every game since Utah State, where that was a matchup where he could exploit Utah State's really soft rim defense. You're not going to get that in this matchup, and I don't think they're going to want too many E.D. Kaufman Wren offensive possessions given that they're going up against a team you just cannot score out the rim against. So I think they're going to want offense and shooting, and they're going to take Gillis minutes, and so I like Kaufman Wren under. Yeah, I don't mind that either. I'm also still mad at Braden Smith for not getting another assist. So he had over the final 13 minutes of the game or whatever it was. I had over six and a half assists. He had five at the half, got a six with like 12 to go, and then never could get a seven. Uh, there you know was a was bunch crazy? of miss, missed shots, missed layups where he had chances to. And then there was a chance at the very end of the game, and they it, they couldn't even get the three off. What were you let's, say? Play, let, let's play trivia. How many non ed 2s did N, did Purdue make against NC State? Total baskets that were twos not made by Zach Eady. Uh twos by not Zach Eady. Mm-hmm. Um Hoffman Wren had a couple. Um I'll say <sighs> Kaufman Wren had a couple. Smith didn't have any. All right. Yeah. Smith didn't have any. Um, I'll say Kaufman Wren and like Lawyer had one. So I'll say three. Three is correct. Lance Jones made them? one. Kaufman Red oh. made two. That was it. Smith and Lawyer were shut out. Uh, Lawyer missed a bunch. I he, I figured he got one. He missed a bunch of layups. Yeah, like, didn't even shots. attempt any. So yeah, that was. Uh, Kind of interesting because, you know, you're going to want to score in the mid-range on UConn too. Purdue can't score anything in that mid-range area. They're in big trouble. Yeah. The last prop that I like, is, yeah. yeah. I was just going to yeah, say, like- that's got to be Smith if they're going to score in the mid-range. He's, he cannot have an O for a day. But go ahead. I like Braden Smith over one and a half made threes. It's plus money in the market. Um, And when you look at his season total, he shot 43% from long range. In this tournament, he's averaging just shy of five triples per game. I think the game script more often than not is them in desperation, needing buckets at the end of the game. And he's one of, you know, their, their key three point shooters. So I think there's a better than 50, 50 shot. He's north of five attempts. So I'll go ahead with the plus money on over one and a half triples. All right. Love it. That will do it for us in the national title breakdown. Hoping for a good game and most importantly, some cashed bets. But from the August college football previews to today, this is my last podcast uh, of my grind. Still be betting baseball, but I will be off on the podcast run until uh, late July, early August when college football comes back. Happy to have a break, but it's always a pleasure to do this. I thank each and every one of my fellow co-hosts, producers on the back end, most importantly, all all of you. Uh, Not going anywhere for a long time, so unfortunately for all of you, you'll have to hear me on this podcast for many more years to come, but uh, it'll be the last time for a while. BBOC won't be going away, though. Calabrese and uh, – is it just you and Colin? Just me and Colin, just doing the baseball grind on the collegiate level. Excited to get into it. Last year was a lot of fun. I would echo Stucky sentiments. Like, we do the show because our fans are so passionate about it. The interaction, reaching out on YouTube, dropping comments, leaving reviews. It seems like you liked it, so we're going to give you more of it and hopefully stretch out a few episodes before the World Series even starts. That way you can kind of build your portfolio and kind of get excited. It is nice that ESPN and other networks are giving it more love, so you have an opportunity to watch more college baseball before the postseason tournaments start. Um, So, yeah, I'm really excited to get into it with Colin. And 
Uh, Debundo, what do you have going on for podcasts? Uh, you, are you doing payoff pitch stuff? I know you're doing Wonder Goal in just a, a little bit. What's what do you want to fill in people for what you'll be doing in the next couple months? Yeah, we're baseball season's in full swing. Monday, Tuesday, Friday, payoff pitch. I am on Tuesdays with Zerillo, the GOAT, uh, every other Friday as well. And uh, yeah, wonder goal. We're entering the Champions League quarterfinals. We haven't quite turned stuck into a soccer fan yet, but uh, we did have 12 goals in three games in the Premier League today. So goals galore, lots of excitement. If you guys want to learn how to bet soccer or just want to get into it or or already into it, tune into wonder goal uh, Mondays and Thursdays during the season. How many times are you, how many times are you, uh, is Charlie going to bet AJ Puck this year over under 11 and a half? Taking he might not be starting that long, although the Marlins are, are desperate. So maybe he's stuck doing that. But uh, it's funny because he made fun of me for betting him the first start and like was like, oh, never believe spring training. And then the second start, there he was. But yeah, we'll see. Long baseball season. It's a, it's a grind. I, I take breaks myself just to mental health checks, but uh, and to just take some time away because it's sort of the off season. But uh, thanks everybody who tunes in. And uh, I'm honored to be a, a guest on the show uh, as in my spot appearances when required. Yep. We appreciate you joining. Thanks again to all of you for tuning in. Football will be back before we even know it. I cannot wait already for the first full Saturday sweat and then match and weekday sweats and NFL Sundays do it all again. But uh, once again, thanks to all of you for tuning in. Make sure you subscribe, unsubscribe, subscribe to our friend, tell an enemy, leave a review, five-star review. I'll do a ton of giveaways in the summer once we're back. They still help us out now. Go review uh, the other podcasts that we just mentioned as well. But uh, thanks for tuning in. Good luck in the national title. We'll see you for BBO C Live tomorrow. And until football season for me, see you next time. Cheers. 